we have Madeline Boyd with us. She'll be talking about a bit of success for permissions in Django. So over to you, Madeline. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Madeline Boyd. And uh, today I'll be talking about how to handle permissions correctly by removing the need to worry about them. Um, the script I built, the system I built is for Django, but I'll explain the concepts in a generic way for those familiar enough, are familiar with other ORMs. So if you work in a system which involves permissions or sharing, I hope you'll learn something from this talk. And I'll try to make sure to save about five minutes at the end for questions, um, but I'll also hang in the Zulub chat after this talk if anyone has anything else they want to discuss. All uh, right, so uh, before we begin, I just wanted to uh, thank my employer, Bit.io, built this while at work, and they're letting me talk about it, which is awesome. Um, yeah. So I guess I wanted to start off by talking a little bit about the title. So the title comes from the expression to fall into the pit of success, that is to have the easiest default be the correct course. So for example, if you're designing an API or framework, you want developers to fall into the pit of success, whereas by not trying, they end up doing the correct thing anyway. Uh, in this case, I wanted to avoid permissions bugs by having permission checking be built into the ORM itself. So when Business Logic queries the database, it should only return, re return results that the requesting user has permission to see. Model object edits or deletes should only be allowed if the requesting user has permission to make those changes and return an error otherwise. Um, so quick outline of this talk. Uh, spoiler alert, this talk fits into the, I had a problem, I couldn't find a solution, so I built a solution archetype. Um, and my problem was the risk of permissions bugs and human error. I wanted to automate them away. So I'll talk about the solution I built. Um, in addition, I'll discuss considerations for using it or when you should not use it, uh, such as potential performance cost and things you can do about it, how to mitigate that performance cost. Um, so a little bit more about the problem statement now. Uh, so uh, Bitdeo, we're trying to build a website where it's really easy to both share and lock down data. So think Google Docs, but for Postgres. Um, so you can use, we wanted to make it easy to upload a file and then you have your database and then you can share it with whomever you want, friends, collaborators. You can even make it public if you wanna collaborate openly um, or you can lock it down and prevent. And we wanted to make it secure so that hackers can't see it, but just in general, anyone you don't give permission to won't be able to see or work with your data. Um, that being said, databases are boring, so my forthcoming examples will use Cake instead. Uh, so quick overview of the existing solutions for managing permissions in Django, just so to help clarify the motivation for this particular system. Um, I'll skim over them because for people who are not Django folks here, um, but I also need to clarify what I mean when I say object level permissions. So because most of the existing, so there is uh, subject verb permissions or subject verb object permissions. So the former, you have a mapping of users to permissions. And so you can say that the user Alice has the eat cake permission, but you can't say that Alice has permission to eat Bob's cake, but not Charlie's, that you need object level permissions for that. So in Django natively, it only has subject verb permissions. There are no subject verb object permissions. If you want one of those, you have to use a third party library. Um, they're the two most popular ones. Uh, both are robust, but in both cases, they require you to, at the minimum, check your permissions manually. So anytime someone might eat cake, you need in the code a, does this person have the eat cake permission on this cake? If so, allow them to eat the cake. Um, and that is what we wanted to bake in. We wanted the system to just say, if you're trying to like eat some cake just and you don't have permission, just raise an error. Uh, so I'll give another example. Uh, so let's say I have some delicious cake and I want to make sure that anyone who is either my friend or likes cake can have some, uh, except for Adam, he knows why. And so here's an example of how you might do this with Django rules. Um, you can define predicates, which are functions that allow the, the function to handle the permission checking. So in this case, if someone is um, 
not Adam, then they will have permission. And this is basically just how it's how you might define it in the code. Um, but and here's how you might handle a permission check. But again, it's quite manual, and we wanted to take the former and simplify it down to the latter. So basically, have the ORM only return results that match the permissions to view the cake. So I'll talk a little bit about how I baked in those permission checks um, and how I applied them uh, automatically. So you basically have to do a few things. Um, you have to take, you have to have a, be able to always reference the active requester or the requesting user in Django speak. Um, in this case, we use some middleware to intercept the, to wrap around the request. Um, to make sure we got that user and we stored it on a thread local variable because uh, requests in Django are thread local scope by default. Um, also had to override some of the ORM methods. So in the Django ORM, you have model objects where each class of, that, of a new model object maps to a particular table and, or some and each instance of that model object maps to a row in that table. Um, whereas Query sets are an abstraction over SQL, so like SQL query sets are an abstraction over SQL queries. Uh, so think selects, think inserts, think updates, um, and manager classes kind of do what you'd expect. They just manage working with models and query sets. Um, and I'll talk about how I override those in a minute. And then also making sure to raise permission denied or the appropriate exception if a requester tries to take an action for which they do not have permission. So here are the methods I had to override. So query set fetch all is the workhorse of the Django ORM. This is what takes your filter expressions in Python, generates a SQL query from it, fetches that query from the database, um, instantiates and hydrates Python objects, and then returns that set to you. Um, and so what we, the most important thing we did here for this permission system was override this, look at the result set, and then do the filtering of permissions there. Um, and then everything, and then model manager get query set is basically a way to inject our version of the query set in. Uh, model save and delete are so that we can raise permission denied if someone tries to take an action or, um, make a change to a model object or delete a model object where they don't have permission to do that. So this is how you handle permissions at the model level. But you can also handle permissions at the field level. So let's say, um, or first, just a little bit more code. Here is how you would, th so the Jenga ORM fetches objects and stores them in the result cache. This is where we're filtering them out. And uh, this is just a perm checklist. It's just because there might be multiple permissions to apply to a given query. So, okay, so this is, so if we wanna talk about field level permissions, um, I'll talk about that. But first I will explain a little bit about fields and descriptors. So the, Basic analogy is that a descriptor is an instance level field. Um, fields in Django are properties on a model object that map to columns in a database, in a table in the database, where again, each row in that table will be an instance of your model. Um, and descriptors are a really cool Python design pattern actually, where it's the power that backs the at property decorator, if you've ever wondered about that, um, where it has this magic method. A, a descriptor is anything that has a magic method called underscore, underscore, get, underscore, underscore. There's also set and delete, but get is the most common one. And it allows you to, when you're looking, so if you, set a descriptor on a as a as a class instance variable uh, sorry as a class property then anytime you look up an instance of that class it will instead of looking up a scalar value it'll call that classes underscore underscore get and return the value of that so that you can have dynamic 
property access and field lookups. Um, and this is actually how in Django uh, you can define a field on a model class and then call that method on an instance and have it return a different value for each instance. Um, so here is an example of how it's used in Django. We have a flavor field. Um, and if you call it cake.flavor, it will return the flavor field if you define flavor field on the cake. Uh, but then when you take an instance of that and you call birthday cake.flavor, this is actually a descriptor, but it will return the value of whatever that flavor is. So in this case, you can think of in Django as field to as a field maps to a descriptor in the same way a class is to an instance. Um, but there's some subtleties there. So here's a more full example of how we can override fields and descriptors in Django and have our own custom descriptors on objects. Basically, you have to override the field and then use a method called contribute to class to get our custom descriptor on the model instance object. And then in the descriptor, that's where we add our permission checks. So um, to get back to my example, so growing up in, uh, in the United States and the East Coast, uh, there was this chain called Friendly's of restaurants that had these ice cream sundaes. And there was always a secret surprise in the bottom of the secret surprise. And you had to eat the whole ice cream sundae if you wanted to, fig if you wanted to find out what that secret surprise was. Um, so if, the secrets, if this Friendly's ice cream sundae was a Django model, um, then each secret surprise, you may want to restrict the permissions on who can see that to only people who have eaten the whole Sunday. And likewise, the only people, like anyone in the restaurant can see the Sunday, but not everyone can see what the surprise is. And likewise, um, the only people who can set that secret surprise, that's a different set of people, that's the only the employees. Because if you had a random stranger and they were trying to shove candy into the bottom of an ice cream sundae, then they would probably either get kicked out of the restaurant if not arrested. So um, that's how you might define it. And then how we actually implement those permission checks. Uh, you have to override the field and implement the contribute to class method. So this is how the contribute to class method on a field class is how it, it, how Django inserts the descriptors onto the model instance objects. It's basically just a fancy set adder, um, but we, if they can do it, we can do it too. So we just call super contribute to class and then override whatever descriptor they have set with our own custom descriptor. Um, our own custom descriptor does the permission checks. So again, the nice thing about descriptors, calls business logic before returning a value, so we can have our descriptor actually do permission checks, which is cool. Um, that's for standard fields, like ints, text field, URL field, great. But Django also has related fields, which are really nice. Um, and so for related fields, you have models that point to other models. And you could have permission checks you need to have, so when you have related fields from, if you have a related field from A to B, and then by default, there is also a relation from B to A. Um, and then you also want to make sure that you're respecting your permission checks on the reverse. So that if, like, I have some permission, like, for example, if you have a friends relation, like, a is friends with B and B is friends with A or an asymmetrical relation. Um, someone may have, if I have permission to know that A is friends with B um, or not, like it's easy, it's easy to check that on A.friends, but you also want to respect that on B.friends. So if someone has permission to see B, but not to know that A is, but not to see A, um, like for example, you're building a social network and you have a profile page and you're listing um, like friends of that user or users that user is connected to, 
then you also need to respect, like if A has a very hidden profile, then you don't want to show A and B's friends list. So permissions can get, so you need to respect both sides of the permission is what I'm trying to say. So the way to do that is not so bad. Um, all you have to do is in addition to Opal writing contribute to class, you also need to override contribute to a related class um, to also, so if contribute to class is what adds like A dot friends, contribute to related class is what adds B dot friends. It's a little bit trickier though, because I, I alluded to Django managers, which are the classes that kind of manage query sets. Um, you also have to implement a related manager class function because the what is dynamically instantiated at runtime is the manager class, which gives you the query set. So you have to do this, which is um, you have to override a method called related manager class. Um, take that original related manager class that is generated at the runtime, um, rela relation permission name in reverse or just some of the business logic for how we add our permission checks. At runtime, dynamically instantiate your own manager class that subclasses the original super related manager class, add your permission check in there, um, and then return your new dynamic related manager class. So Python is awesome. You can do stuff at runtime. Uh, if Django can do it, we can too. All right, so that is, um, I skimmed over a bunch of code uh, for the sake of time. Feel free to ask me questions um, after this or in the chat. Um, I will also talk a little bit quickly about ACLs, which is, how to record who has which permissions on which things. Um, there are some permissions that can't be easily defined in functions. So say you have a list of people who are explicitly allowed to eat a birthday cake, like the list of invitees at a birthday party. Um, or you may have people, or even with different roles. So like maybe the birthday, uh, the birthday boy or girl has special permission to blow out the candles. Um, so in this case, we have a way of permission similar to the Django Guardian way of recording permissions, where we have an ACL model object with uh, three fields. You have the accessor, who is the subject of this permissions model, the requesting user, the resource, which is the object that is being accessed, so a particular piece of cake, and the role, which determines the level of permission that the subject has on the resource. So for example, the role could be like birthday boy or girl, birthday attendee, parent of boy or birthday girl, whatever you want to define. Uh, so this is um, our ACL class. And we use Django foreign keys, which are uh, one to many relations. Because for every accessor, um, for example, a piece of cake may have many accessors that point to it. But a given accessor will only point to one piece of cake. Uh, that's so the related name is so on the cake you might call cake dot ackles and it will return the set of ackles. Um, we also use something called we also use uh, a modified delegate pattern and that's because relations in Django can only point to one other type of class when you define them. Um, and if you want to point to multiple different types of classes, then you. Um, you have to use something called generic foreign keys, which breaks down the a lot of the nice um, metaphors of the Django ORM system. Um, or in our case, we created an intermediary object with a one-to-one relation, which allows us to, um, and then that type, in this case, a class of type access or delegate or resource delegate can point to has different fields to point to other different types of classes. Um, so our resource delegate is a stand-in for cakes or pies or toppings or frosting types. Um, so this is how we get around the 
Django ORM limitations on like what types of classes you can link in relations, but also still allows us to use a lot of the nice things about how the Django ORM works. Um, we tried generic foreign keys, but we had a few issues with it. Uh, Django Guardian does use foreign keys. Uh, okay, so now I'll talk a little bit about some considerations uh, that should be taken into account when using a system like this. Uh, so number one is performance. Um, do not make database calls in your predicates. Uh, this will make your code slow. Django has a nice thing called prefetch related, which will fetch and populate related fields and specific related fields on those. So you can fetch all the fields you need to conduct permission checks in one database call. Um, so for example, if we were wanted to look at an object, like a cake object, but we needed to fetch some fields to see if we even needed the cake, what you want to avoid is the default, which is Django is like, oh, you want to look at cakes. Okay, like let's look at cakes and then go to the database, fetch a bunch of cakes. And then, oh, but in order to see these cakes, you also need to see, you also need to know what type of frosting they have. So let's also do a lookup on the frosting table. And like, not just that, let's do a lookup on the, like a separate lookup on the frosting table for each cake you're looking at. Like, no, 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 no. Let's just get everything we need in one database call and then check the permissions on those populated fields. Uh, one thing we did to avoid this was to write a hook to raise an exception if in a predicate call, uh, Django calls the database, which helped us catch some things. Um, and also Django Guardian has a method called prefetch perms to prefetch uh, fields needed for permission checks. So if you're using Django Guardian, use prefetch perms, I would recommend it. Um, so another thing you can do is explicitly check the permission you need and then override permission checks so you're not accidentally over checking, per checking permissions in a redundant manner um, in your, when you're doing queries. Uh, if you're doing this all the time, then Django Guardian or Django rules will work great and you don't need a system like this. Uh, so again, here is, if this is the query you're making and then in the, to, if you need, in order to look at cakes, the permission view cake is baker or is customer, you may wanna prefetch the fields you need to make that permission check. Yeah, don't do that. Do this. Um, this can be overkill, uh, a system like this, if, for example, um, you don't check permissions very frequently or you want to be explicit with your permission checks because you don't trust magic. Um, then you probably, or for instance, uh, you don't have, you don't need to check subject verb object level permissions. Um, in all these cases, there's either existing solutions that work better for you, um, and you don't need to bake it into the ORM. So the other consideration is that this is like, they say, you know, pick libraries, not frameworks, and I believe that, and I will always take a library over a framework. This is, it's not quite, it's not a framework, but it's approaching it um, because you have to have custom base model classes. You have to have custom Django or a man management. Um, so I guess it's not that bad, but it would be nice if you could just drop it in a little bit more easily. All right, so that is the system I've built. I haven't open sourced it yet. Uh, one of the things about working in a startup is that uh, you don't, you have to stay focused and I just haven't had the chance to dedicate some time to open sourcing this. Um, but this is my Twitter. Um, so Madeline is spelled weirdly. It is not a, my mother thought this was the common way of spelling this name and it is not. Um, but this is how you can reach me on Twitter. Um, or boyd at bit.io is my uh, work email, and that's a little bit easier if you'd like to reach me there. Um, but if you would like to use this or you're working in Django and you think this would be cool, um, 
let me know. Uh, the reason I built this was because I was hoping, so Django has a lot of third party libraries and I was hoping that something like this would exist. And then we spent some time looking and couldn't find it. Um, so if someone could tell me like, oh, actually you should just use this library. I'd be like, I wish I had found you a year ago or 18 months ago, <laughs> like that would have been great. Um, but yeah, so reach out. Um, thank you for coming to this talk. I really appreciate uh, you're taking the time uh, as PyCon India wraps to a close. Um, and I also just want to thank uh, my colleagues at Petrodeo who helped me work on this and build it. And uh, thank you conference organizers for putting this together. So um, I guess I'll take some questions. Thank you, Madeline, for the, for the wonderful talk. Thank you. Uh, and the really nice analogies about you know, ice cream sundaes and uh, a lot of and and thanks specifically for uh, touching about the considerations you know uh, with with examples it made it really simple to understand what you were trying to explain thank you and i specifically like this code that you know uh, for the easiest to be the default uh, for the easiest default to be the correct course uh, yeah. i think that's how every library or a framework should be written yeah i um the phrase i got it from a former colleague nick Schrock. uh he was I forget, I don't know if he got it from somewhere else, but he was mm -hmm. one of the creators of GraphQL, so. Ah, oh. nice. Okay, so we, we do have a few questions for you. Okay. So uh, first one, so when I have to implement permissions at a field level or object level, I have to access some methods or attributes beginning with an underscore. So I think uh, underscore or dunder. Mm -hmm. So is it really okay to use them? Uh, I guess this depends on, um, how, so I guess who, I need, I need to know a little bit more to answer this question. Uh, are, is like you and your business logic adding the underscores or is it some internal framework that's adding the underscores? Um, I mean, in general, underscore means private, nothing is private because it's Python, but I guess, I mean, I'm also like dynamically subclassing things at runtime. So is it really okay to use them? Maybe like take a pause and just understand what's going on. I like, if this is, it sounds like this is probably some other library or framework that you're using. Um, be aware that this API could break on version updates. So just like take any version bumps more closely, but um, it's your application code. And if this is an open source framework, then like <laughs> this is kind of the risk they take by making the code open source. Um, so yeah. yeah, I think, yeah, I think that's the perfect answer. Uh, like we, we have to look at the circumstance and the kind of use that we are trying to do. So mm -hmm. how are we trying to use it? So yeah, makes sense. Yeah, I mean like look and see if there's a maybe a more robust or easier way, but like I'm also happy to like look at the details of this a little more closely if you want some more help yeah yeah so probably the hoster could maybe catch up on zulip yep find me in zulip yeah. next one how to create relationships between two tables in graphql Ooh, this is a great question i haven't worked with graphql recently so i was so with graphql i was one of the original like the original three beta testers um but like, i haven't worked with graphql in a few years so Unfortunately, I'm probably not the best person to answer this question. Um, there's there's actually another one on GraphQL. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I feel so embarrassed by it. I'm so out of date with my knowledge. I think I think probably you could you could take them on Zulip. So okay. I think there's one about performance. Oh, okay. How, How is the is performance the perf compared to REST? Um, I guess the... So the analogy would be, so if you're making a REST request, you can have permissions with that or not. I think like the best analogy is not necessarily compared to REST, but compared to what if you did the permission checks at runtime yourself, or um, if you didn't do permission checks at all, like what is the performance comparison there? Um, mm -hmm. And I would say it, depends a lot on the permission check you're doing um, mm -hmm. and how complicated it is. But for a naive and like, it's basically, 
it can be pretty minimal so that like the overhead of permission checks is on the order of like 10 tens of milliseconds, um, which compared to the total request time is like, that's like for total permission checks. So that's not so bad. If you're doing things like not prefetching and checking database calls and predicates, then you can easily add a couple hundred milliseconds to your total time um, mm -hmm. or whatever the cost of like a hundred database round trips is. Um, mm, yeah. Yeah, that, that makes sense.